All right, this morning we're going to make a journey. I've entitled my message, Pushing on the Doors of Providence, the Remaking of Adventism. And uh, be a little bit of a different service, but I'm, I'm anticipating what God's getting ready to do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the divine worship hour, the music, the offerings, the prayers. And now, Lord, the opening of the word. So bless us, I pray. May we be uh, living letters upon which you are writing, on which the world reads. Guide us now to that end, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If we could bring that slideshow up. If it's up, let's see here. Uh, let's go back one. All right, I'm going to start the service a little different. And I'm going to give you a gift. But I want to make everybody aware. We are getting ready as a church, potentially, to undertake the biggest project we've ever undertaken. We've purchased property next door at close to a million dollars. We own it in hand. That's a miracle all by itself. I don't have time to go into it. The money was provided by the Lord through this congregation and the online audience in about five weeks. We're standing on the cusp of a question mark. We're going to go forward with what we have. We have six buildings over here, two garages and four houses. And uh, go ahead and start giving these out if you don't mind, gentlemen. Everyone here can take one. If you really don't want one, you can uh, leave it on a table on your way out. But I want you to pay attention to this quote. Why are we ready? It says, the home missionary work will be farther advanced in every way. Put these on your refrigerator. And every time you look at them, I want you to think of this. God's cause in America will be farther advanced in every way. Now, I'm going to present two things today for the remaking of Adventism. The first is the spirit of true sacrificial interest in the missionary work. When a more liberal, self-denying, self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions. Now, this is counterintuitive. It doesn't seem to make sense. The idea that my heart going out to the people in El Salvador or the people on a reservation or the people in Brazil, the idea that my church would be blessed and benefited when we have a self-sacrificing spirit for people that will never be able to do anything for us in every way, farther advanced. Don't miss this. For the prosperity of the homework, my church, Village Church, depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the evangel evangelical work done in countries far off. When I go to the doctor and he taps on just beneath my knee with a rubber mallet, my foot kicks out because it's a reflex. It works every time. Now, this morning, I want us to remember that it's in the working actively to supply the necessities of the cause of God that we bring our souls into touch with the source of all power. Woe be unto the pastors, the elders, the deacons, the deaconesses, and the parents, who for the sake of convenience and for the settledness of their lives, keep their young people unconnected with the source of all power. There's something about saying this work must go forward, as Jesus said, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people that brings us into the source with all power. Now, uh, there are two things that I want to specifically point out to you this morning. One is that on a reservation in the very northeast corner of Montana, there is now a beautiful about $1 million building sitting there that will be uh, dedicated and celebrated in about two months. We're taking our village bus out there. If someone wants to join us, call the church office. You can be a part of it. We're going to have the North American division there. But these reservations are blighted places in America, and now there is this beautiful about one acre plot of ground, three different RV hookups, and it's waiting as a center of influence as a church. We made a commitment to this when we had no money in the village church, none. And we didn't raise all the money for this. We were just, by God's grace, stepping forward and providing not only resources, but people. Now, I wanna go to the next place. This picture is about five years old. This is about 600 students on the campus of ECUS, which is the El Salvadorian Elementary and Academy. 
And what they did was we asked them to come out and stand in an outline of what the new college would look like. And here's an aerial shot of these 600 kids standing there in a barren piece of ground, waiting, hoping that when they finish through the 12th grade at the high school, they don't have to go to the public college or come up with a super large uh, financial package to go into a different country. By God's grace, next Sabbath, we'll be with our union president celebrating this 30,000 square foot college, which is now waiting for the infrastructure of the academicians and the administration to come into place so that our El Salvadorian brothers and sisters and our Guatemalan and Honduran brothers and sisters can get a college education at least in English, in theology, and in education. If we don't do anything more than that, the idea that we could train pastors and teachers in this college, and I'd like this little memento. These were hand-painted by the students of ECUS. Some of them have been waiting almost two years now for this college to open. They've finished and they're waiting. They're working and they're waiting. I saw them painting these uh, a couple years ago and I said to them, because I thought maybe we could help them make a little money instead of just giving money away. And I asked them to make 500 of them. If there's somebody here today who didn't get one, call the church office and while we're down there as a large group of about 160 people organized under the village church will be going down on Thursday. Our advanced group will be going down on Tuesday. But I want you to know something. The reason that we are on the launching pad of potentially beginning a medical missionary work, no, we're not potentially beginning it, we are beginning it. How large and how significant we go is somewhat dependent upon the sense of God's leading. But we're there with a completely different financial picture, a completely different unified church. We're there because we made commitments to things that had no ability to bless us except in all the ways we needed the blessing. And I'm here this morning to remind you that in the beginning, Adventism was a work of commitment and sacrifice and joy as they watch God come down into the midst. Ellen White wrote this 122 years ago. In a due course of time, a sanitarium will be erected at Bering Springs. And I inserted the word why. Why Bering Springs? Because when she wrote in 1902, the school that we called Emmanuel Missionary College was brand new. It was just opening. And she knew, as the only college that the Seventh-day Adventists had, that the young people would funnel into this place. And in this place, they could be taught how to do medical missionary work. Their heart would grow as they served and cared. Their mind would expand as they learned how to treat people primarily without drugs and empower those people to prompt their bodies to fight back in better ways. So Bering Springs is a unique community. Now, it's not the only place we now have college, but it is the place for the flagship institution, which is in a moment of renewal itself. And in cooperation with the university, as I met with the president a few weeks back and showed him our master plan and said to him, we want to support you. And he said to me, we want to support you. There is a power to channel our youth into experiences that the modern medical establishment aren't able because they don't fit the remuneration model of large amounts of money in short amounts of time. No, these methods don't generate as much money and they take more time, but they are dynamics that create a bond between us and the people we serve. Not to compete with any other sanitarium, but to help represent our work in clear, straight lines and to give the students an opportunity of learning how to care for the sick. Now, why medical missionary work? I want you to pay good attention. If you're a pastor, an administrator, an elder, play, pay very good attention here. The medical missionary work has been pre presented as the entering wedge of present truth. Let me see a show of hands. Has anybody here tried to split wood by hand? I don't mean hydraulic. I mean an ax or a maul and a wedge. Could I see your hand? Do you know how wedges work, the rest of you? A wedge is something you tap into the wood because the wood is fighting you. Now, I can tell you if you go to split something like um, an elm, elm wood, because I was a wood splitter at Andrews University for a long time. Elm is so stringy, it hangs together. 
You take something like red oak, it just pops open when you hit it with a maul. But you know what? You get those big pieces of wood, you tap a wedge into it. I want to tell you, friends, there are people's hearts out there. There are whole communities, including very intelligent, educated ones, for whom there's going to be no getting into the inside of who they are without the gospel doing a special work. But this won't be a, a, a particular amazing statement, but you know what? It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, smart or not intelligent, well-educated or ignorant, everybody gets sick sooner or later. And even as I'm driving around in my car yesterday, I'm listening to the uh, Friday science program on NPR, and they're telling me about the problems of drug-resistant antibiotics. Now, the, real, the reality here is that medical missionary work has been presented as the entering wedge. Well, we have a desire to get the word out to everybody that God loves them, and he's not the one who burns you in hell forever. He's actually the one that has given his complete self for your redemption and your re establishment in the, earth, in the heavenly family. The entering wedge of present truth, it is by this work that hearts are reached and those once prejudiced are softened and subdued. This is the work that is to be done today. I want to remind everybody that when Ellen White says the removal of the, the separation of the doctors from the pastors is the worst evil to come upon the church, that what God had in mind is that every doctor was as much a missionary as every pastor, and every pastor was familiar enough with how to treat, without drugs, a lot of the basic ailments as many medical workers would be. And the truth of the matter is, is that when a spirit-filled, compassionate medical person, because when you're sick, you're vulnerable. When you're sick, you're weakened and you're needy. When somebody with the kindness of Christ empowers you, prays for you, lays hands on you, there's a bond that's created. And that's why the devil knows. Separate those doctors and pastors. Destroy this health ministry work. Keep these Adventists from treating the whole person because if they actually do something effective for the human body, they might find effective healing to the soul. This is what the devil didn't want. But I'm here to tell you, friends, it's time for Adventism to rediscover itself because the entering wedge that makes present truth able to reach hearts is through this kind of tender, thoughtful, kind medical ministry care. Michigan is one of the best mission fields in the world. Could somebody say amen? amen? Listen, God started the work here. Oh yes, it had a New England, it had a little New England flurry, but to get this work really going, it came here to Michigan. There's something about the culture of this, of this state and this conference that was formed. There's something about the people that she could make this observation about, and I think it's still true, but it needs men of far-seeing judgment to push the work. Now, I wanna know, how many Michigan men and women are committed to pushing the work? Because I'm here to tell you today, friends, God's work isn't gonna move with casual contact. God would have those in responsible positions show tact, skill, and wise generalship. Now, these aren't pushy people, but they are men and women of push. They believe something should happen. They are to detect, to seize, and to put talent to use. Let the pull back principle go, and the go forward principle come, because the third angel flies swiftly. Let many now ask, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Is it the Lord's purpose or will that his method of healing without drugs shall be brought into prominence in every large city throughout the medical through our medical institutions. God invests with holy dignity those who go forth in his power to heal the sick. It is the Lord's purpose. It's his will. So when you go to pray, sometimes we're asking for something and we've been taught by Jesus to pray and Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And that's important to ask when you don't know what God's will is. But I want you to know something. Every city like Detroit and Grand Rapids should have this kind of ministry going on in it right now. And some more people ought to start praying and pushing. Some more people ought to start sacrificing and giving.
Because if we're going to reach people's hearts, we need to reach them when they're sick and they're down and the doctors have run out of options. But the answer to the prayer of the spirit-filled medical practitioner is heard and the methods which are different bring to life the system in its recovery and along with miraculous intervention. It is God's will. So friends, it's time to do a little more praying, a little more sacrificing, and a little more pushing. Let the light shine forth farther and still farther in every place to which it's possible to obtain entrance. Satan will make the work as difficult as possible, but divine power will attend all true-hearted workers. Guided by our Heavenly Father, let us go forward, improving every opportunity to extend the work of God. Now take your Bibles and open them, if you would, to the book of Exodus. I'm going to do a real quick survey of a few different things in the Bible. Exodus chapter 13. And I want to show you. I'm not going to read it all to you. I could easily do it. But in Exodus chapter 13, we have Israel being ejected from Egypt. And God is going to take over and guide them. Unfortunately, they're not quite as ready as... uh, they needed to be for the journey. It wasn't because God didn't give them the preparation. It was because they refused to trust and learn the lessons. Exodus 13, 17, it says, Now when Pharaoh had let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though it was near. For God said the people might change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. Problems. Verse 18, Hence God led the people around by the way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. And the sons of Israel went up in martial array from the land of Egypt. Skipping down to chapter 14, God led them into a place where there would be no escape. Mountains on one side. Actually, they came down into a wedge of of, uh, geography where the sea was here, the mountains were here, and Pharaoh was coming in just like this. But God had told Moses that Pharaoh was going to chase them. See verse 4 of chapter 14. It says, thus I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after them and I will be honored through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. It was pretty scary according to verse 10. They looked off, they could see the glimmer of sunlight, that Egyptian hot sun on their swords and their shields and the people were afraid. Go a little farther into chapter 14 and we get God's response to Moses and to the people. Verse 11. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you've taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Now listen to me, every leader, every pastor, every parent, every teacher, every administrator, every president, The church would very much like for you to leave them alone. Leave them alone. Let them rot in the complacency of their low-level commitments. Let their children be picked off by that lion that's going around. Give them no grand purpose to aspire to. Let them be sought after by the best Fortune 500 companies. And let them make lots of money and live wonderful lives. And that's it. There's lots of churches where they'd like for you to be left. There's a lot of rich people that would like to be left alone. But I just need to remind us and anybody that might fit that category according to your description and definition to whom much is given, the Bible says much is what? Expected. And God's expecting a lot more out of us than we've done. And the truth of the matter is our absence of instruments in the church in general, including the foreign mission field, has left the church to slowly lose ground. If it was an airplane, slowly lose altitude. Until finally we're in a position where we've got the pull back principle that's operating, not the push forward principle. God told Moses, why are you crying out to me? Turn over to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter three. I wanna look at another significant moment in the experience of Israel. It didn't work. So 40 years later, they're gonna get to do it again. Joshua chapter three. In this case, Moses is dead. Joshua is the leading spokesperson for God. Verse 2 of Joshua 3, at the end of three days, the officers went throughout the camp. Verse 4, they separated the Ark of the Covenant by 2,000 cubits, a bit more than half a mile. 
Verse 4, however, there shall be between you and it, that's the Ark of the Covenant, a distance of about 2,000 cubits. Go to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. Verse 10, Joshua says to the congregation, by this you shall know the living God is among you. Verse 12, now take for yourselves 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each man. Verse 13, you got to go forward. Verse 13, it says, it shall come about when the soles of the feet of the high priest who carry the ark of the Lord of all the earth rest in the waters of the Jordan, that the waters of the Jordan will be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. When the Lord said to Moses, go forward, he did not go backwards, but forwards. Much is to be done in the Lord's moral vineyard, but we cannot expect to stand still and see the Lord do the work which is left for his human agents to do. Those who really feel that they lack heavenly wisdom may obtain wisdom from the source of all wisdom. Glory, hallelujah. But if we trust in our own human devising, we shall meet with failure. Now I want you to go just a little farther into the book of Joshua. Go over to Joshua 14. Joshua chapter 14. It's 45 years after Kadesh Barnea. You remember giants in the land? Ten spies said, can't do it. Joshua and Caleb said, sure we can. God's with us. In Joshua chapter 14, verse 8, this is what it says. Verse 8, Caleb wants to go in and take the land of the giants. He says, nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt with fear, but I followed the Lord my God fully. So Moses swore on that day saying, surely the land on which your foot is trodden will be an inheritance to you and to your children forever because you followed the Lord my God fully. Now behold, the Lord has let me live just as he spoke these 45 years ago. From the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses when Israel walked in the wilderness, and now behold, I'm 85 years old today. I am as strong, still as strong today as I was in the days of Moses when he sent me. As my strength was then, so my strength is now for war and for going out and for coming in. Now then, Give me this hill country about which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day that the Anakim, the giants were there with great fortified cities. Perhaps the Lord will be with me and I will drive them out as the Lord has spoken. And then skip to verse 14. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, until this day because he followed the Lord God of Israel fully. Now listen. This is round two for Adventism. Ellen White would commonly say, we could be in the kingdom ere long this, if. And this whole component of medical missionary work, we're in round two. We watch Kellogg take over the sanitarium and build it into a, math, a, a mammoth complex, which is still there. You can still go on tours to see it. Unfortunately, during the Great Depression, he had so leveraged himself financially that he lost it all. Of course, he had lost a whole lot more when he found himself fighting and wrestling with James White and the presidents of the General Conference. Friends, God is giving us a chance to reclaim the high ground. He's giving us a chance to put purpose and ministry and love and service into our own hearts with our professionalism and into the hearts of our young, that they don't aspire to be doctors and lawyers to make lots of money and have a wonderful life, but they aspire to weaponize their education for the driving back of darkness and the illuminating of light. It was by faith that they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. In marching down to the very water, they showed that they believed the word of God as spoken Moses. They did all that was in their power to do. I'm afraid a lot of Adventist churches fall very short of this. They did all that was in their power to do. And then the mighty one of Israel divided the sea to make a path for their feet. Light from heaven will illuminate the pathway of those who no matter what the trials and perplexities may, they may encounter, go forward in the way of obedience, looking to Jesus for help and for guidance. We are too prone to regard obstacles as impossibilities. To have faith in the promises of God, to go forward by faith, pressing on without being governed by circumstances is a lesson hard to learn. 
Listen to me, all you boards of chairs in various organizations and institutions and pastors and churches. If this is a lesson hard to learn, but it's a critical lesson for what we're going to face, then we ought to start having the, the, the primers of the most basic elementary and rudimentary teaching. It doesn't matter how size of church you go to. If your board and your elders and your pastor want to get together and start praying, if they want to explore the writings of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, and they want to rediscover, like Josiah did, the principles that make people strong in God, God will reveal them to you, and then he will give you little steps to take. Little steps. This church, 11 years ago, looked pretty worn. It was 50 years old. It had the same carpet it had the 50, um, 50 years before. It had the same red pews. These nice pews you're sitting in, they used to be red. We used to have a Christmas celebration every Sabbath here in this church. <laughs> the walls were full of that dark paneling that we had in the 70s when I was a kid. We knew it needed to change. We got together and we prayed. We put a building committee together. What a great place to come undone, arguing about the carpet and everything else. But I want to tell you, that's not what happened. We prayed. Sometimes we did argue. We apologized. We went back to praying and talking. And the process of bringing this place back to a basic semblance of beauty was a journey of togetherness. And I want to tell you what happened. We decided the first place to start would be this stage. And in the process of doing it, we postulated it was going to take a couple hundred thousand dollars. We didn't want to go in debt. And so we said, we're going to go as far as the money goes. And when the money runs out, we'll stop. And I want to tell you something, almost a million dollars later, the whole thing was done. We never stopped once. Every time we needed to go forward. Now, having said that, how this church works is, is it does a big project for somebody that will never be able to bless it. And then it comes back and takes care of one of its own needs. And then it goes back and does a project for somebody somewhere that'll never be able to bless it. And then it comes back and takes care of its own needs. And we're not trying to be lavish. This is not a lavishly decorated church. It's a simple, classy elegance. But I'm here to tell you, friends, we have never found that money is our problem in this church when we're doing things according to God's will and God's principles. This is where we're at. And I want to tell you, I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt, the fact that we bought this property in less than six weeks, God sent us, sometimes through our own giving, through many people's giving here, sometimes through partners with people we don't even know that watch us online. Thank you for our online family. But God spurred us along when somebody came and wrote us a large check for over a quarter of a million dollars and said, we're more than 100 years behind on this work. Go ahead and get busy with it. Even this morning, those people texted me, thank you, and prayed that God's spirit would be upon me as I stood in behind this plexiglass pulpit this morning. I'm here to tell you, friends, that if this is a hard lesson to learn, let's get on with learning it. And there's a reason a lot of churches can't go forward because they're not united. But if you want to get united, pick a mission project where you can agree on, and then maybe last generation theology and women's ordination won't be the biggest items the church has to deal with. Oh, we should have done better than that. I'm here to tell you, when I was a young man in my last church where I stayed for almost 20 years, someone, I'm certainly well-meaning, wanted to interject one of this subject matter into the whole nominating committee. I said, look, I'm not here to be the social reformer of the Seventh-day Adventist church. I'm here to help this church get a figuring out of what it needs to do for reaching the lost. That's who we are. And we can argue ourselves theologically to where we've got the go backwards principle working instead of the go forward principle. But if you're a church board and you want to know what God wants you to do, you're going to have to make a new commitment to getting together and knowing each other and bonding so you can talk and pray. And so the first thing that looks impossible, you don't say to yourself, it looks like an obstacle. You don't say it's impossible. Look, we've got great minds in this church, minds that understand building and finance and all kinds of other things. But when it looks impossible, that doesn't mean it is. It just means it's an obstacle. 
And we should examine all the challenges, but we don't stop there. And in order to get a sense of God's will, you've got to pray and talk and talk and pray and pray and talk and talk and pray. And if you haven't taken any little steps, you probably aren't ready for a big one. So figure out where God's guiding in the baby steps because before you walk, you crawl, before you jog, you walk, and before you run, you jog. But I have a sense right now that we're getting ready to start something that's going to take a little more than we've been used to giving. In God's service, we shall meet with obstacles and difficulties. But this must, these must not be allowed to discourage us. Events belong to God. Somebody should say amen. And his servants will meet with difficulties and oppositions. Why? Because he wants us to. For these are his chosen methods of discipline and his appointed conditions of sure progress and success. Do you understand that every project we undertake for God is growing our faith so that when we stand on the 21st century plain of Dura and they say, bow down or die, we say, thank you, King, we've heard you. And in all due respect, we've already made our minds up before we got here. And if God wants to deliver us, he will because we've watched him provide over and over and over again. And if he doesn't, he'll be our peace as we say our final goodbyes. Listen, friends, every, cha every challenge the church faces is preparation for the final showdown, and that's going to be a humdinger, bigger than any anybody has seen before. God is before us. I can assure you that whether it's David, and David was told no, but if you read in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, even though David was told no, he wasn't going to be able to build the temple, you know what he did? He saved up so much money and he challenged all the elders and he basically said, Solomon's a young man. He's going to need your prayers and your support. And the book of Chronicles chapter 29 tells us how much money he gathered up and challenged and everybody else gathered up. Listen, who gets to decide who calls cadence in the army of Christ? When Christ musters his soldiers, he may have you marching left, right, left, right, but then he may say double time march. And he may actually dismiss us into an all full-out assault. But Jesus is the cadence caller in his army. But if a church isn't together enough to hear it, then they're never really going to be together enough to face off with evil and win. Years ago, when William Wilberforce was fighting for the abolition of slavery in all of the British Empire. I mean, this was the United States of its day. He fought for three decades. Finally, as William Pitt, the youngest Prime Minister of England was dying. William Wilberforce went to see him. He's laying there on his bed. And William Pitt tells him, we've got a succession plan. Wilberforce says to him, you're not dead yet. But William Pitt goes forward and he tells him who the new prime minister is going to be. And then he says, we've secured the permission of the king. He says, Willie, the next time you go before parliament, you'll be pushing at an open door. And I want to tell you, friends, I don't know what the doors look like, the obstacles. They may look barred and locked to us. But when we pray our way into what God wants done, when we go to praying and pushing, not being pushy with each other, but being powerful in our faith for God, we will see the doors open and we will watch things happen that could never happen any other way. May God bless us as a people as we remember that the medical missionary work is the entering wedge. It creates the connection with the hearts. It is to be, there is to be a sanitarium in this town. What we're getting to do right here may only be a step to that, but it's the step. And may God guide us as we commit ourselves to the task that is before us. It is the remaking of our own spiritual journey, Adventism, and it is a moment in which God is gonna move some mountains, already has, already will, and we're looking forward to seeing what he does. Let's stand together as we sing our closing hymn.